Most of the world today knows of Isaac Newton, that great scientist who formulated the laws of motion and, and universal gravitation. He, he discovered that light is a combination of seven colors and invented a, a reflecting telescope and, and, and on and on and on. Today, he's a household name in the scientific world. Most people don't know that if it weren't for another scientist by the name of Edmund Haley, the world might never have benefited from the work of Isaac Newton. It was Haley who challenged and mentored Isaac through his original ideas. Haley even corrected Newton's mathematical errors. Haley coaxed a rather hesitant Newton into publishing his discoveries. In fact, Haley even edited those early manuscripts and personally financed the first edition of Newton's great work on mathematical principles. Well, Isaac Newton began to reap the rewards of scientific prominence and prestige while Haley remained in the shadows receiving a little credit. He really didn't care. His mission in life was to simply advance the field of science. Historians today, though, refer to it as one of the most selfless examples in the academic world. In fact, if it weren't for the comet uh, that he discovered, named after him, Halley's Comet, we might never have heard of him at all. Well, our wisdom journey today features a man who reminds me of Edmund Haley. It's an account of, of one man who launched the ministry of another man, but remained uh, for, for the most part, in the shadows. The church knows a lot about the Apostle Paul. Many, however, are, are not even aware of the selfless actions of another leader in the church by the name of Ananias. Saul is this zealous persecutor of the church. He's been converted to Jesus Christ. He, as we studied, was going to Damascus to arrest Christians, but was effectively arrested himself by the Lord but now physically blinded by that glorious light of the resurrected Savior and, and mentally stunned with the reality that Jesus was indeed the Son of God. He, he's come on into Damascus. He's been waiting now for three days to be told what to do next. Now, while Saul is waiting for further instructions, the Lord begins working in the heart and life of a church leader who, according to Acts chapter 22 and verse 12, is a man of godly character. I want to pick up that account here in Acts chapter 9 and verse 10. There was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. The Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, here I, here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, rise and go to the street called Straight. And at the house of Judas, look for a man of Tarsus named Saul. For behold, he is praying and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Now, you might notice that the Lord doesn't tell Ananias anything about Saul's conversion. Ananias only experiences, I'm sure, the chill of hearing the name of the church's archenemy, Saul of Tarsus. So how's that for a difficult assignment? The Lord tells him, I want you to get into the same room with Saul, and that could be a death sentence. You know, I happen to love that the Bible doesn't polish up what happens next. Ananias' initial response sounds exactly like something I'd say. Verse 13, Lord, I have heard from many about this man, how much evil he has done to your saints at Jerusalem. It's as if he's reminding the Lord of, of how bad Saul has been, as if... <laughs> as if the Lord doesn't already know. And now, as Ananias says here in verse 14, he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call on your name. Ananias is thinking what I'd be thinking. You can imagine him saying, Lord, uh, well, you said he's blind and can't see. Well, that, that sounds like an answer to prayer to me. If he can't see us, he can't catch us. Oh, this is great news. The Lord patiently responds here in verse 15, go, 
For he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So here's what's happening. Ananias knows everything about Saul's past. God knows everything about Saul's future. Ananias knows Saul was the great persecutor of believers. God sees him as the great preacher of the gospel. You see, Ananias, he, he, he sees a murderer. God sees a redeemed messenger. So for Ananias to carry out God's assignment, which he, he does, he has to act in faith. He has to believe that God knows more about Saul than he does. And and frankly, Ananias becomes, for you and me, a great example of faith. But perhaps even more importantly, Ananias becomes a great example of forgiveness. You see, the Lord is at least hinting to him that, that Saul has been changed, converted, forgiven. God is actually asking Ananias to do nothing less than act as God's agent of forgiveness by revealing first God's unforgiveness of Saul. In fact, back here in verse 11, God tells Ananias that Paul was praying. Well, well, that's a clue. Pharisees did their praying in public where they could be seen, not not in private. In addition, they don't normally hold prayer meetings in houses. But the Lord tells Ananias that, that Saul is praying over there in the house of a man who lives on Straight Street. To this day, this is still, by the way, the main road running west to east through Damascus. Yes, Straight Street is still there. Well, God's saying, Ananias, he's over there on Straight Street in that house. He's he's praying for guidance. You see, he's a changed man. Well, Ananias believes God, travels really by faith down Straight Street to welcome Saul into the family of of believers. You know, I can't help but think that we need more travelers on straight street today. People who will leave anger and bitterness and resentment behind and humbly, graciously extend the forgiveness of Christ to others. Verse 17 describes the moment they meet. So Ananias departed and entered the house and laying his hands on him, he said, brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road by which you came, has sent me so that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Did you catch that? Brother Saul. Once enemies, they're now brothers. Well, this address indicates Ananias and the believers uh, he represents. Well, they're going to forgive Saul just as God forgave them. Well, he then, he then tells Saul to be filled by the Holy Spirit. That literally means to be controlled by the Holy Spirit who's come to indwell him as a believer. Now, no doubt is a sign of Saul's acceptance into the family of God. Verse, verse 18 tells us something like scales fell from his eyes and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized and taking food, he was strengthened. So following Ananias' wonderful example of acceptance, we read of Saul's acceptance by the church family here in Damascus, if you can can imagine. In fact, verse 19 says, for some days he was with the disciples at Damascus. This is an incredible turn of events, isn't it? They had heard Saul was heading their way with the authority to arrest them. They're undoubtedly overwhelmed with fear and concern. But the one who had come to capture them is now one of them. Saul is overwhelmed, I'm I'm certain of this, by their love and immediate acceptance. People he had come to imprison, torture, well, they're sharing their meals. They're sharing their joy in Christ with him. Former enemies have now become family members. What a wonderful demonstration of the grace of God. And as soon as Saul has an opportunity, we're told here in verse 20, that he proclaimed Jesus in the synagogues saying, he is the son of God. 
Imagine him preaching that message. Well, because of the humility and support of Ananias, Saul, who's going to become known by his Roman name, Paul, uh, he's going to take the gospel now throughout the Mediterranean world and and beyond. And, and indeed, the world will never be the same. Edmund Haley introduced the world to Isaac Newton, yet he's still unknown to most people. If his name is familiar at all, it's probably because of the comet named after him, a comet he accurately calculated to appear about every 75 years before disappearing again into the vastness of space. Haley wasn't concerned about gaining fame or glory for himself, so like that comet, he just quietly disappeared into the night. And Ananias, too, is going to soon disappear. He's going to disappear into the shadows of Paul's prominent ministry. Yet he leaves behind this wonderful example of humility and courage for every one of us today. Let's care more about the gospel than our own glory. Let's care about the glory of our risen Savior and Lord. And to that end, beloved, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.